Welcome, folks, to this week's Data Science Dossier Unwrapped. Usually, it's just me by myself. This week, I have a special guest. That special guest is Tim Allison, ex-JPL and MITRE Wondrousness. And I've invited him along this week. We're going to talk about search and document processing because with the amount going on in the AI and LLM space, getting those documents processed, getting them available to enterprise users is something that's, you know, is, is key for uh, not getting garbage out the far end. So I will ask Tim to introduce himself as he will do a better job than me. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, uh, so Tim Allison, background is a little uh, innovative, shall we say, for tech. Uh, I got a uh, certain classics as an undergrad, uh, got into uh, computational linguistics there, went to uh, graduate school in classics. Um, got a PhD in that, and during that time, I got into natural language processing. I uh, just fell in love with that. So uh, two years as a professor of classics and then moved into NLP full-time, focusing on entity extraction, machine translation, all of the good old things that we used to do. Uh, over the course of my career, I've gotten more into search, uh, content processing, file processing. Felt like nobody was paying attention to, pro to file processing, so it was... Lots of areas for improvement there. Fascinating stuff. It's, a, it's an interesting sector to get into. Like I always thought I was going to be a systems administrator because I knew Linux stuff when I was growing up, and I didn't get a I didn't get into systems administrating by any stretch of the imagination. So, getting into sort of document processing, text extraction, and search stuff. It definitely doesn't seem like a normal avenue to take if you've got a a classics PhD at the end of the day. It doesn't. Um, the, uh, the, there are some amusing things, though, where there really is a, a nice tie-in. One is a tool that I wrote when I was at MITRE uh, that did something that was an invention in the 16th century, 15th century, which is a concordance, which is a way of uh, searching through a text where you have your keywords in the middle, and then you have the words to the left and right, and you can get a, a good sense of how that word is being used. Uh, we use that all the time in classics, and I found that for advanced searchers, for analysts who are doing deep dives on uh, large bodies of text, it was a really useful way of getting through all of that text uh, very quickly and understanding patterns and discovering patterns in that text. Also, obviously, the interest in language. Uh, I've worked on a number of multilingual uh, search projects and understanding how languages can vary and tokenization, normalization, all of that stuff has been really important. So it's not quite normal, I will admit. It's not... Not not a common path, uh, but I just totally fell in love with uh, natural language processing in grad school, and that's you know it, towards the end of grad school when I woke up in the morning. That's what I really wanted to do. Um, so it just took two years to pivot, and here I am after a couple more years in between. <laughs> <laughs> so these days, um, well, so for a bit, a bit of, I was going to say as a bit of a backstory, you haven't traditionally been a consultant. Um, you haven't been a, a freelancer in, in that uh, traditional sense. You've worked with some uh, rather large organizations. Um, you know, do you want to speak about a little bit about who you've worked for uh, over the last you know, decade or so? Sure. So I uh, started out at the professor at Smith College, a uh, visiting professor there for, for uh, two years. Um, then I moved to a, a university affiliated research center at College Park, which was a lot of fun. There I moved into MITRE, uh, which operates several federally funded research and development centers, which are trusted uh, advisors for uh, the U.S. federal government. At MITRE, I was in a tech shop that focused on human language uh, technologies, uh, HLT, uh, so that we could take our expertise and um, talk to various areas of the federal government, which was a lot of fun to see uh, various challenges throughout. Uh, and sometimes the similar challenges across uh, organizations that you wouldn't expect to have similar challenges, but search is search, right? Although there are a lot of different flavors of search. From there, uh, Chris Matman made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I had to come to JPL, I guess it's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and be the tech lead for uh, JPL support to a DARPA project called SafeDoc. Um, in that, the easiest way to get me to JPL was via uh, starting my um, LLC, sole proprietorship. LLC. Uh, so I did that for that job. Uh, and along the way, I've had uh, some some consulting experience. 
uh, with some large cloud vendors, also with some much smaller shops, uh, just helping them with configuring our Tika for text extraction, uh, improving uh, components of it, adding uh, custom parsers or custom features. And also I've had some engagements with uh, helping enter with enterprise search, helping people tune their search uh, because enterprise search is hard out of the box. The open source projects are not uh, going to get people what they want. Enterprise search is hard, but I thought you just stuck everything into an elastic search index or uh, open search these days, and then just chuck some random JSON at it and you got the results out the far end. You do get results out. Yes. Do they make sense? Is it, you know, is it that simple or is it, you know, you said it's hard. No, I mean, so, so that, I mean, I say that tongue in cheek, of course. Yes, of course you do get results. Um, the, the trick though, is that uh, web search in some ways is easier than enterprise search. Uh, because there are a lot more sig obviously it's a much larger scale um but you have many more signals with um, links uh, typically people are focusing more on html as as the useful content there are lots of things that make enterprise search really hard one the big one is that there aren't a bunch of people in enterprises that are spending a lot of time on seo internally right on search engine optimization internally uh, so it takes a fair amount of uh, effort to tune these things for how you are uh, configuring Elasticsearch or OpenSearch or Solar, uh, and then how you're constructing the queries and, and so on. So that, that's been a bit of fun. Uh, along the way, uh, while I was still at MITRE, I wrote um, a genetic algorithm package to help tune uh, the, these various configurations uh, for the enterprise search, for enterprise search challenges. And it's, it's been kind of fun. It's been able to boost some scores at, at some places. So it's it's been gratifying to see that work out. That's cool stuff. So, um, in terms of, well, so I should explain a little bit. I obviously knew you from prior to us working at JPL. We've known each other for longer than that. Um, and we know each other primarily through the Apache Software Foundation uh, and open source software and contributing to the open source ecosystem that is Apache. You are a uh, chief custodian, I would like to say, of the Apache Tika project. Uh, can you tell our listeners, uh, for anyone who doesn't know what Tika is, what Tika is, uh, and who you know who might use it? Who might use Tika to to you know uh, enhance their workflows? Sure. So Tika is a, a Java-based framework that does uh, file type detection and applies parsers to those files to extract content, uh, text, and also metadata from those files. Um, it, it covers the major file formats. But we also do some niche things, SQLite and so on. And it's a very extensible uh, framework so that it's easy to add parsers to, for, for new file formats or if you want a more performant parser uh, than what you can get with uh, uh, pure Java, for example. So Tika's this, uh, we have a, Tika server, so you can hit it with an API uh, call, and you can also put it in your own code, uh, or you can run a Tika app. So there are a bunch of different ways to run it. Uh, so the question of who's who, who would use it or who would want to use it is, is amusing to me uh, because it's so far in the weeds, inside, embedded in so many projects that people don't even realize they're using it often. Uh, it's used across e-discovery. It's used in major uh, search systems. It's it's in integrated into Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, Solar. They have handlers that have Tika. I'm pretty sure I saw it in Haystack. There's a Tika thing for Haystack. Um, so Tika is, is all over the place. If you are just coming to file processing, it's a really handy way of dealing with batches of files wherein you don't know the, uh, the file format. So that's kind of a, a quick overview of Tika. So if I was interested in using Tika, uh, primarily what uh, programming languages would I have to be, you know, what, what can I leverage it in in, in, terms of a, in terms of an application stack? So um, obviously, if you want to embed it in your, in your own thing, uh, Java, uh, or any of the JVM kinds of things, uh, Groovy and so on. Um, but also there's Tika server. So you can call it from Python, and Chris Mattman has a nice wrapper for that. Uh, Tika Python, I think it's called. Uh, but anything that can that can send bytes uh, to a Tika server, or even uh, we now have the Tika pipes module, uh, so you can send just a little bit of JSON to the Tika server with a key to the file on local file or S3 or somewhere else. 
Tika will fetch those bytes, parse the file, and we'll put the output uh, into S3 or Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, Solar. That's pretty cool. That's interesting stuff. I mean, I've, I've used the Tika server a few times, and like, it does have, it does have a, a UI for people that want to just be able to open up a file and see stuff inside yeah. it. Um, you know, so you, you don't have to run it at a, at a high, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, deployed to a server, but um, like the, 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 the ability to be able to call it from uh, a REST endpoint and stuff definitely is, is a nice way of interacting with it. And the stuff that you get back as well is um, insightful for us document um, newbies who don't really understand what's going on behind the, the scenes. Uh, Reb, on, on, on Tika, I mean, obviously you've been involved. How many years have you been involved with Tika? It seems to have been like forever. Yeah, I was, I was looking back at some years of joining things, and it has been forever. It's uh, probably more than coming up more than ten years this year. Yeah. So the just I, I got involved in Tika because I was working in some spaces where they were using Tika, and I was noticing that it was missing really critical pieces of information from uh, I think initially uh, Microsoft uh, Office files. I was missing the key piece of information for this massive document. Um, that I was helping people try to understand. Um, so I, I made a patch, sent that off. I was like, in Notepad or something. I mean, it was old school. And Nick Burge kindly helped me along and said, oh, this looks great, but you might want to fix it up a bit. So Nick was really kind and, and brought me into, um, into Apache Poi, which is the Microsoft Office library, and then Apache Tika. Um, so that, that's how I got into Tika all those years ago. Yeah. And was it also the, how you got into programming? Sorry. Did you do programming before that or is this... Was... Oh yeah, so I mean, well, when I grew up, I was all over basic and, or, you know, I'm embarrassed to say, but did a little bit of Pascal. Um, one of my favorite uh, summer camp things was we were doing um, uh, whatever the machine code was for the, for the Mac at the time. We were doing like little Pong games and stuff. So yeah, I always had that as a side interest. Uh, in grad school, when I started getting into uh, natural language processing, I started working in Perl. Uh, which I just went head over heels for. And then I also took um, the intro to programming class, which was uh, C, which I also thought was a, a bunch of fun. Um, but after that, I went back to Perl because it was a lot faster for coding, of course, and for what I needed, um, and then moved into Java. Nice. That's cool. That's a nice little pathway in. Um, so obviously you've been doing Tika for a long time. What do you think are your your proudest achievements, your biggest achievements in the Tika project over the course of the many decades that you seem to have been there. Yeah, well, okay. So I, I think that the, the biggest contribution I've had uh, with the community, and this has not been a, a solo effort, uh, I, did, I started when I was uh, back at MITRE, which was creating a massive corpus of files for testing. Uh, and then also coming up with the code to test whether or not we were doing better uh, on different versions. So, for example, in our code base, we have a couple hundred unit test files uh, within PDF box. They may have probably short of 100 files for testing. The amount of different features within file formats is so profound that that small number of files has a tiny number of the features that these parsers might come up against. Uh, so working with uh, Julian Noach, working with... Uh, other Apache Tika folks, uh, we pulled uh, millions of files from Common Crawl. Uh, we set up a server, uh, thanks to uh, kindness of all sorts of people along the way. Uh, most recently, of uh, Marwan saw on the PDF box, uh, P PDF box project. He's uh, contributing a server for, uh, for us. Uh, so we have these millions of files. And before we make a release, we run our, uh, our previous version and our, our, our release version. And then we see if there are any surprises. And when I first started on this, I thought, well, we'll be able to automate this, right? We'll be able to see whether this is better or not, right? But you, you can't because um, if you have more exceptions, that could be a good thing because now your parsers are more strict in letting you know when there are problems. If you have fewer exceptions, it means that maybe you were accidentally dropping a parser or the parser got more lenient. That could be a bad thing. So we have code that offers indications for a human to go through and say, is this better or worse? With random sampling, we can get through that very easily. But having that process in place so that we are testing it on millions of files before we make that release has been a big thing. So that's number one. On part of, as part of that, the other thing that's been absolutely critical for especially enterprise search, but others as well, is adding effectively what, what we call a junk detector. Um, so we take 
Uh, we have language identification in Tika. We've taught, we've uh, run through a bunch of multilingual corpora. We found the top 30,000 most common words in a language. And then we just count the number of common tokens uh, in a given text string. And if, a, if the text that's pulled out of a, of a file doesn't have a lot of common words, it could be an indicator that something went horribly wrong and things go wrong all the time in PDFs especially, but also in HTML and so on, where, where character set encoding detection is still not perfect. So that junk detector is really important, especially uh, with all PDFs and some other file formats where extracting content uh, can be challenging at times. If people wanted to test Tika, they can, of course, go to the website. They can download Tika as a, as a UI, as I mentioned earlier. They can download the server. They can use their favorite package manager to uh, Maven install it or whatever into their application. If they wanted to get involved from an open source perspective, because they want to be, you know, want to contribute or they want a project to get involved in, I assume Tikra, of course, has like hundreds of committers on a regular basis, all like, you know, building this stuff out to uh, serve the masses. So, you know, can they go, can they get involved in an easy way? Yes, of course. Uh, so the, the, the road to, to there is, of course, to join our, our TikTok and start doing some crazy videos on, on the importance of text extraction and whatnot. And we'll have a following instantly because everybody cares about it. But seriously, and um, the way to get involved is uh, sign up on the, on the user list, on the, on, the mail, on the mailing list, because that's the way we still operate. That's the Apache Software Foundation project. Get involved there on the mailing list, start opening issues, start um, finding problems, uh, finding areas for improvement, opening uh, pull requests, and so on. That's one of the ways to get involved. You can also, of course, help with documentation, help with answering questions on the users list, uh, helping with answering Stack Overflow questions. Those kinds of things are also really helpful uh, for a project. Uh, when you talk about our hundreds of uh, committers uh, who are standing by on the Apache Tika project, it's not quite as robust as one might like for the number of committers who are active on the project. We do have a very strong team of uh, people who chip in here and there, uh, but we are kind of like a famous like, KCD uh, comic where, the long, where it's like Bob out in Omaha or whatever uh, is, is, is holding up uh, this massive project, which is responsible for parsing, you know, trillions of files around the world every day. I, I think... Uh... You know, I was obviously joking about 100 committers, but I think this is the thing about open source software. Of course, one of the nice things about the Apache Software Foundation, Apache licenses, it's business friendly. So if people wanted to pick up Tika and use it uh, in part of their application, they can do so. There's no restrictions from a license perspective. But there's, you know, Tika obviously is used far less frequently than HTTPD or Tomcat or whatever. But it always stunned me when you go to uh, what they what was known as ApacheCon and what have you, and you'd meet up and you'd find like the core committing team for Tomcat is like, you know, four guys just like madly working through CVEs and stuff. And it's no dissimilar across all these open source projects where, you know, there's a lot of people consuming it, but not anywhere near as many people giving back. And, you know, it'd, it'd be nice to see more people giving back to software where, you know, they feel like they are getting benefit from it. And it's a nice thing, you know, working on projects at JPL or whatever, the fact that you can combine, I assume, I'm putting words into your mouth, but, you know, I suspect it's nice that you can work on your pet project, your open source project, and get paid for it at the same time. I mean, it must be, it must be a nice situation to be in. Yeah, for the last 10 years, 11 years or so on, it, it, it's it been really nice to be able to convince the people I, who are sponsoring my work that it was a valuable thing to work on uh, Tika to help them uh, on the projects I was working on, but then also help the open source community. I have been extraordinarily fortunate to uh, be able to contribute to the the open source projects as part of my, as part of my job. Um, the other fun thing that goes along with that is that on a number of projects, especially proof of concept and so on that happen uh, in, inside, say, JPL or MITRE, uh, those projects can be one-offs that kind of help get proof of concept proved and then, you know, you, you pass it off to somebody else. So the great thing about working on open source projects is that you are contributing to an enduring project. So there have been a number of projects that, you know, started off and ended, nice proof of concept here and there. And if I hadn't been working on open source 
code and helping it along the way, I would just say, yeah, I have this nice bookshelf of things that kind of worked for a bit. Um, but, but putting effort into the open source communities has really been gratifying because it's, it's this enduring set of uh, code that's uh, being used today and is critical. Uh, it's, it's good. It's good. To, it's good to see and hear. I mean, you know, the fact that companies are willing to sponsor. I remember back like, when I started in open source, and companies would be like, "Oh, can we leverage this product?" But actually, don't commit the patch back because it gives our competitors an advantage. And that's just, yeah, it's boneheaded, isn't it? At the end of the day, you know, you want everyone to be able to succeed. And you know, if you can improve your product, and maybe it helps the competitors at the same time, but everyone benefits. Well, hopefully, everyone benefits at the end of it. So, yeah. Okay, moving on. Um, for anyone who follows your LinkedIn profile, I recently have seen a bunch of stuff about safe docs uh, from DARPA. Um, can you tell me a little bit? You know, I know we touched on bits of it earlier, but can you tell me a little bit about what safe docs is about uh, and the news that came out of the PDF Association and uh, the safe docs project the other week? Sure. So that, that's a, there are lots of things to talk about here. So first off, Safe Docs was a four-year uh, program, uh, DARPA program, uh, to improve uh, parser development. And the focus there, the, the recognition of the project was that when people that in verifying inputs, which is what you're doing when you're parsing files, is one of the major CWEs uh, areas for vulnerability. So if you let people just write parsers where they're verifying code, here and verifying or verifying inputs here, verifying inputs all over the code base. Uh, you're, there will be problems. There will be bugs. So the Safe Docs approach was a Langsec based verified program approach where you aren't, where developers aren't building parsers anymore. They're developing the spec for a given file format, feeding that into a parser builder that will then build a robust verified programming based parser uh, that will be far more robust than anything. That, a human can generate. So that was the overall goal of Safe Docs. The initial focus was on PDF files because they are so complex, and offer so many challenges, uh, and because PDFs are used uh, all over the world uh, in any number of any number of use cases. So that was kind of a Safe Docs focusing on PDFs at least initially. Uh, JPL supported the evaluation component of uh, the Safe Talk program, so we were responsible for gathering millions of PDFs for the uh, tool chain developers, or the parser builder people, uh, to use to test out the tools and evaluate those. Uh, and we also built a file observatory, uh, which allowed uh, uh, parser developers to extract various features uh, from files, PDFs specifically, but any features from any parser can go into this thing. And then you can search through and look for patterns, correlations. Uh, you even had a a, um, a geospatial you know visualization, so you could see where different files were, around, from, were coming from around the world if you had geotags. So that was a lot of fun. That was uh, Ryan Stonebreaker, uh, Mike Polano, uh, Anastasia Mosakova, and helped with that at JPL or built it really. Um, and that that was that was a bunch of fun. So that was the Safe Docs program. The JPL support to that came to an end in uh, July last year. That was a really good program. So you then asked about PDF Association and their announcement. Yes. So P PDF Association has, uh, there, there are two main things that PDF Association was interested or benefited the community from in this project. First one was on our side. We worked with PDF Association to gather and put together a corpus of 8 million PDFs, about 8 terabytes of uh, PDFs. And we were able, before the end of the program, we were able to publish that uh, through Digital Corpora. Uh, Simpson Garfinkel uh, kindly found a way through his AWS sponsored public open data sets thing to publish eight terabytes of PDFs so that the industry, PDF parsing industry can now, all of the different vendors can now pull from the same corpus, test the tools on the same uh, set of files uh, for you know new feature development, bug finding, all sorts of things. Just been a revolution in uh, what developers and what uh, commercial systems are able to, to use to, to leverage to, to help build their parsers. The other thing the PDF Association did, and this was purely on them, this was not something that JPL contributed to, was they created something called the Arlington DOM, which was a machine readable, effectively a machine readable spec of PDF and all of its various versions, so that 
you can easily, fairly easily write a parser that uses this spec to say this part is, or this part of the file is in spec, this is not in spec. And it helps developers make sure that their parsers are handling things in, in a responsible way. Uh, this is starting to be embedded in various checkers, especially in digital preservation, but I'm sure, but it's also being used by vendors uh, to help them uh, validate uh, their parsers, but also uh, PDFs. So it, that, the, the Arlington DOM and the Arlington Checker are both extraordinary uh, contributions, and uh, we'll be seeing the effects of that for the next decade at least. It's it's a massive contribution. So, congratulations to the PDF Association. They did an amazing job with that, and Peter Wyatt especially was the, the leading the charge there. So I assume uh, that the uh, Tika regression tests will now start training themselves over all eight million or eight terabytes worth of uh, documents every time the uh, the project is uh, built and compiled? Well, no, not quite yet. <laughs> uh, we, we don't quite have the resources, but if anybody who's listening to this wants to share those resources with us, I'm sure Marwa would be happy to uh, stop funding us every month. Uh, thank you so much, Marwan, again for that server. Um, but no, it, we, we have self-selected, I think, a million PDFs uh, from the Corpus add-in to freshen up our PDF collection. Uh, so yes, it has definitely helped uh, helped Tika. As part of that, though, um, you know, we found numerous bugs in PDF box and a bunch of other PDF parsers. So in simply putting that together, running a bunch of PDF parsers against those files, and using those files as seeds for fuzzing, which was extraordinarily valuable, uh, we found a tremendous number of bugs already, and the benefits from that work will will also continue for a good number of years. And like for, to a layman like myself, I'm like, well, it's just a document. Although I do have nightmares of like Adobe Acrobat and stuff from the 90s. So, I mean, I am scarred by PDFs in general. Um, but, you know, from, from a document perspective, can you explain to, you know, the less educated in the world of documents um, how a... PDF is constructed and how you might end up bricking your laptop when all you're trying to do is open the thing. So, so it starts know. with an XREF. It starts with a header. Yep. And then you go, oh, no, uh, but seriously. Um, all right. So PDFs are a, a page based format. Uh, so they, for, t they, they can contain images. So they can contain images of text only uh, or they contain text, but the text that's in there is more how to render them on the page. So the text that's actually stored in the PDF is not necessarily um, uh, stored in a way that a human would recognize it. As part of the Safe Docs program, I did put together a PDF that um, it, to a human would look like, uh, what is it? Uh, I am, uh, was it, uh, I am Lord Voldemort. But then when you uh, did the text extraction and the text extractor was just pulling out the logical storage of characters, it would say whatever the Tom Marvolo thing is, right? So. You can, extracting content from a PDF can be uh, extremely challenging. Now, on to the question about vulnerabilities. You mentioned denial of service attacks. Uh, so there are, I've come across some PDFs that are entirely within the spec, but because of the way they're, they're designed, they will completely peg a, a laptop in, in lots of uh, parsers uh, because of the complexity of the trees and the cyclic graphs, unfortunately. Uh, so it's, can be uh, a challenge for denial of service. Obviously, PDFs can also have uh, JavaScript in them. That's mostly defended against now, and you have to sign on. And say, yeah, give me that JavaScript, which is dangerous. Um, so that's that. That's kind of a boring attack. One of the more interesting attacks that we came into, in as part of the Safe Docs, was looking at uh, parser differentials. So that's where an attacker can know that Tom, for example, is using a particular piece of software and can make the PDF look as if it's saying one thing, but then when it sends off to the billing department, it will say something else. So it's a, it can say, here, Tom, approve this payment for this account, and then the billing department will get the same PDF, but because they're using a different browser, it will have a different account number in it. Um, so that, uh, that kind of parser differential can happen visually, it can happen with the text that's extracted. It, a lot of the times that goes down to uh, structures within the PDF that are kind of out of spec where different parser developers have chosen how to respond to those kind of out of spec thing in different ways. Those kinds of things can be exploited. So the closer we can get to a secure uh, subset of PDFs, 
where they're actually in spec, the better we can be to avoid those kinds of parser differential attack. That's pretty amazing. I never considered <laughs> it. Some of those, are, I was like, okay, it's better. But like some of them, though, yeah, that's um, that's pretty out of this world. So, like from a safe docs perspective, how does the existence of the safe docs program help PDF vendors, Adobe, for example, in the future? You know, you talk about JavaScript and stuff inside of a PDF, which sounds utterly insane. To I mean. Well, it's, it's like VB macros and Excel and stuff. It was always an attack vector, wasn't it? Like if you can automate something inside of an Excel worksheet, then that's cool because you can go and do stuff. So from a safe docs perspective with PDFs, uh, you know, how does this, how does this help vendors in the future? So ideally the notion is that vendors would have that vendors across the spectrum would participate in creating parsers that more carefully to the spec so that there aren't differences in processing ambiguous components of the spec. Safe Docs also added a number of features to the spec, to the 2.0 spec, uh, that will help clarify portions of that for developers so that developers are working from clear, unambiguous descriptions of what's expected in the files. The, yeah, the JavaScript is is certainly an area of, of interest, um, but that's largely, as I said, largely been solved by applications just not allowing it or requiring the user to accept the that vulnerability. But the, the safe doc stuff is much more profound, much more far reaching, uh, and also, frankly, it got the parser developer community into understanding what PDFs are about. So it dramatically improved the knowledge of uh, the PDF spec and all of the complexities of the PDF among the super high-end parser developers, and hopefully they will get jobs or move into um, helping these uh, companies write on um, these parser uh, building kits, parser construction kits, uh, so that these legacy companies are perhaps using this new technology to build at least portions of their parsers. Because I just, obviously we were talking about open source software earlier, and I suspect, so, you know, I, you, I'll test this hypothesis out on you, but I suspect that um, getting the various vendors together that have to deal with PDF documents on a daily basis, building out viewers and editors and all that type of stuff, getting together in a same room or same venue, um, a bit like when people are forced to do of open source software, I assume the PDF <laughs> spec is open, it would, at least at a developer level, maybe the bosses are not too keen on this, but at a developer level, at least it would facilitate some collaboration and expanding of, you know, skills and what people are trying to do across, across the platform in general. Yeah. So as, as we've experienced with the Apache Software Foundation, bringing people together, the PDF Association is the nonprofit that brings a bunch of stakeholders together, commercial and uh, open source. Uh, mostly largely focused on commercial, but also chatting with open source communities and companies that do both to come together for the, for the ISO PDF uh, spec. And yes, different companies will have different opinions and it, it won't be one happy world where we all agree on everything, but the PDF association has done an amazing job of bringing this community together to make enormous progress in any number of ways, especially accessibility, um, which we haven't even talked about yet. Um, but accessibility is a major issue in PDFs. Uh, we're bringing the community together and the accessibility communities together to help improve uh, the accessibility of PDFs. It's, it's just been absolutely uh, critical uh, for the format. Documents in general, uh, this is getting properly like nerdy at this point, but like documents in general, like compared to like the early 2000s, you know, I think about the advent of open office and all that type of stuff, and you'd open a Word document, I know we're not talking PDFs now, but you know, I'd open a Word document in open office and it would look like junk. And then I'd open an open office saved Word document in Word and it would look like junk. And PDFs, you could never edit on anything other than, you know, Adobe Acrobat stuff and what have you. And it was just like everyone was completely siloed by the different document formats. Whereas these days, and actually, I remember walking in London with a friend who was like, um, he was saying that Microsoft back in the, at the time were one of the biggest contributors to one of the like Word document passes 
but they do it via like back channels. So it wasn't obvious that they were trying to drive the interoperability, but it may, I mean, but it makes sense, doesn't it? But you can see now how obviously everyone thinks that being able to open an Excel, an Excel, open a PDF in a different platform is going to be detrimental to the core business. But in reality, it's just allowing people to make better use of stuff is in that format, in which case people are going to buy more licenses or Word, you know, Office licenses or Adobe licenses and what have you. So it seems to make sense um, that you want that cross-platform accessibility these days where I can edit a PDF. It still seems quite hard, but edit a PDF on a Linux machine and so on, be able to see it on a, on a Windows machine. And obviously having a spec that allows people to define what that's supposed to look like, I guess, is, is benefit to everyone. Yeah, uh, so a couple of things. Uh, first, PDF from its beginning was intended to solve that problem. Whether it did is a different story, but especially with the notion of that page-based viewing th uh, portion focus of the document structure, it was supposed to be the way to transmit exactly the same visual information from computer to computer, application to application, operating systems, even to printers and so on. So that's what it was supposed to do from the beginning, and it did a much better job, as you pointed out, there in Microsoft Word versus, you know, Open Office where things were kind of placed all over the place because PDF is focused on that rendering, was from the beginning focused on that, on that rendering uh, component, whereas uh, Microsoft Office files are focused more on content and the structure within the document. So it's paragraph based rather than page based. So that every time you open a Word file, the application has to re um, calculate where the page breaks are and all of that other stuff. Whereas with PDF, it's very clear, you know, you, you go to the X, Y coordinate on this page, place this C here and so on to, to draw out the text on that file format. Um, so that's been the, the, the vision of, of PDFs for a long time. But yes, anything that we can do to make that better is going to help uh, with that. Second, yes, applications are getting a lot better across uh, file formats. I've noticed even within the last two or three years, you can open up a PDF in Microsoft Word and it actually looks really good. And then you can edit it there without having to go through some of the hoops, depending on the PDF, of course, because one can always generate a PDF that causes problems. Um, but one can edit it much more clearly, even image only PDF sometimes, Microsoft Office appears to be running OCR on those and then making those editable, which is really exciting. One more thing, getting back to accessibility, the other exciting, um, development over the last three or four years is that Microsoft and uh, Google and Apple have made an effort to have at least at least the possibility of exporting a PDF that is PDF UA, so universal accessibility, which means that it has lots of features in it that allow for better accessibility for for humans. You use uh, need help uh, with accessibility for you know this is a title and so on, uh, but also for machines, uh, for understanding, for trying to get this paragraphs back into logical paragraphs, which uh, is absolutely critical for LLMs because LLMs need paragraphs. They need natural language. They don't want the bits and pieces of word soup that can come out of PDFs if they're not well constructed. So to get back to that, that second point, it's been really gratifying to see the big vendors coming out with uh, PDF UA as at least an option, if not default, and some of them are now turning into default, where they're creating these PDF UA documents. Um, and I can talk about the structure of the PDF UA uh, in another th in a podcast where we go into the I was gonna say, depth I mean, of PDF. You know, just touching on that, I mean, I remember asking you a question about extracting table data a while ago. <laughs> it was like, you know, switch this flag in Tinker and suddenly like this tabular data was coming out. And I was like, that's, that's amazing. Like, because I mean, the other thing as well is for, we haven't touched upon it and it's not core to this podcast, but of course, yeah, we're talking about Tika as a whole, but of course it can extract a lot of information from stuff that is not textual. I mean, Tika has the ability to extract information from images. It can do OCR stuff that I came, I think came out of DARPA Memex and some other stuff as well that was kicking around at the time to get uh, OCR in as well. So even if people are like, well, actually I don't have any documents. I've just got loads of, you know, JPEGs or stuff that I've pulled down from the internet and I want to extract you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a PDF or a Word doc. It can be literally anything, can't it? Yes, absolutely. And we've also, getting back to PDFs for a bit, uh, as you, and getting back to your point about tables, 
if the PDF has that that table structure in it, if it is a PDF UA and has those tags for the table, yes, TP can extract those, which is really exciting. Not all do, and some images are, are some PDFs are image only. And for those, we've uh, built in an algorithm that says if you don't get much text out of a page, and somebody wants to run is willing to run OCR on a PDF, we will run run OCR on that page to try to extract text. So we 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 have this. We have some heuristics on when to run that, but that is has has been an exciting development because Tesseract OCR was uh, integrated. I, I agree as as part of uh, DARPA's MemEx program, I believe. Time. Tyler Postlich, I think, did that integration, and it's pretty awesome. That's cool. So let's leave um, Tika for a little bit uh, and move on to search itself, and so. Um, you know, everyone is headed into dense vectors and neural search. Uh, what have you done in that space? In lightness, in the, uh, you know, the, the dense vector search space, uh, and, you know, what are your current takeaways uh, for the state of the art? What's, what's, what's burning a hole in your need to learn some more stuff? Because that's, that's really cool search. All right, yeah, so we live in... Seriously, very exciting times in search. Um, where I've been working mostly has been on uh, Open Search, which had you know, which uh, was a fork of Elasticsearch, which was a traditional Lucene-based, uh, token-based uh, search system. Uh, BM25 was the algorithm that was is is the most popular um, similarity metric, uh, relevance metric in uh, in those systems for for token-based search. Over the last couple of years. Uh, Lucene community, uh, which is funded by folks at Elastic and at Lucid and at a bunch of other companies that use Lucene, have added vector search, have added dense vector search. So over the last uh, couple of years, we've seen, and even over the last couple of months, we've seen really important improvements in open search and also in Elastic search in making it easier for developers to bring in the neural search, to bring the the the, the vectors from uh, these LLMs or or, uh, or BERT or whatnot to allow for vector search. What's been exciting, there have been a number of things that are exciting about that. What it tells me, what we're finding in a, in a lot of the conference presentations on for people who are actually working with this, though, is that the best relevance comes from a combination of hybrid search of this traditional token-based search plus this vector search. So what that means is that the magical technology is not solving any problems and taking away all the complexity. It's in fact only adding a crazy amount more complexity, um, which is good and, and it's fine uh, because the value can be really impressive. The improvements in relevance ranking can be really impressive if things are set up right and so on. Um, so it's it's really exciting to see stuff going on. And I have seen, I've worked on uh, excuse me, a RAG, a retrieval augmented generation prototype, which is where uh, user answers a question, traditional retrieval or hybrid retrieval brings back relevant passages, and then no LM will summarize that or, or answer the question based only on that information, which really limits the, when it works, it limits the ability for that, um, for the LLM to just completely make stuff up. Because I... I said to you, I think I said at the start of this podcast, but I also said to you the other day, didn't I? I mean, like the the the, the job that you currently undertake, uh, I feel that companies who want to leverage AI and the latest and greatest LLMs and stuff, you know, there's there's an awful lot of obviously garbage in, garbage out. There's also an awful lot of finding the right data. If you've got petabytes, terabytes or petabytes worth of data stored in an Elasticsearch index, uh, you know, it's it's all well and good having a chatbot that can answer questions. But if it can't find what it's looking for or understand the context of the documents and the stuff that it's extracting, it's not going to produce any type of uh, sensible results, or not the results that companies really want, and where the value, the additional value, will come from. And so, you know, it feels like, um, you know, there's going to be an awful lot of work coming over the next few years as companies all try and, like, you know, do something with AI so that they can be relevant in a in an LLM world and that type of stuff, which involves 
document storage, archival extraction, and processing. I have so much to answer on that one. Yeah, um, just been taking notes. All right, so yes, all of the companies, you know, RAG is, 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 the, is the hot new thing now. Um, many, many companies are doing it. Most, some vector, vector first companies are doing it vector only. Yeah, so that, that's the current, current thing. Um, what I find, there are a couple of things. One is junk in, junk out, yes. And that's one of the important reasons for the junk detector uh, is that if you get complete junk out of a PDF and you throw that into your index, well, now that can be retrieved by an LLM, which could be really dangerous, especially if it's completely garbled text. Um, it could do some exciting things uh, to an LLM. Um, and it also just fills out, it bloats out your index and it's a big mess. So that's one of the reasons I'm really proud of that junk detector in Tika. But yet, and also, um, one of the things that I've noticed uh, as companies are moving into RAG and in, into, the, into the Brave New World is that they're actually making CERT better simply by chunking up the documents. Because of the context limitations, these LLMs can typically take, you know, a couple thousand tokens, maybe. Behind the scenes, they have to chunk up the document and put those into different chunks. Well, if we did that with regular search, would get better results automatically. Um, so it's, but it's an extra step in a, in a in a longer process. So lots of developers aren't going to do that. But that's really the way, even in a traditional search system, to deal with an in, intranet search system where you have a 600-page PDF and a couple of you know short news articles. Well, how are you going to deal with the relevance of that, right? Well, one way to do it is to chunk up that big big 600 page PDF into smaller documents and you'll get much more relevant results because the um, one from a retrieval perspective, but then also from a snippeting perspective for that user interface where you're showing the most relevant portions. If you give a 600 page PDF to a snippetizer where you know you get the first five, five terms that show up, that's not going to be as useful as if we had already broken up that document ahead of time. So that's been amusing to me and to watch these you know, ma major companies and the, all of these framework having to chunk up these documents, which automatically in and of itself makes search better. Um, and then on top of that, you have the, the all of the really great um, similarity search uh, with the LLMs um, in that vector, the 10th vector search. That's, those are some exciting things to watch. So uh, we've touched on bits of this, but from an LLM perspective, uh, clearly it's going to have a large impact. It's already had a large impact on search, as you just alluded to. But, you know, uh, as LLMs become more and more used in general business and not just, you know, companies that can afford to train high, highly expensive models and stuff, how do, you, how do you feel that the, you know, the search is going to change with the advent of LLM technology? <laughs> In, in, in five seconds or less, sure. Um, as long as you want. I mean, there, there's so many things. So in, in, in the near term, I'll start there. What excites me are not... So RAG is neat. RAG is awesome uh, when it works. Uh, what I really like about RAG is the notion that it can point to specific source text so that a human can get the made-up summary, excuse me, the, the, the RAG summary, but then also gets those links back to the original document so that it can make sure that the information that this thing has made up, uh, summarized, uh, is accurate, right? That's, that's kind of critical. Aside from RAG, however, LLMs can be extraordinarily useful now in areas where humans don't see them and where if they're wrong, it's not a problem. So within tuning a search engine, there are, we've been using NLP for any number of years to extract human names, to do categorization, to do all sorts of other document enrichment uh, behind the scenes, and then we use that at search time as well. So those kinds of things are going to only get better because the performance of these LLMs on those tasks is pretty impressive. Um, but if they get it wrong, then it's okay because, you know, our old NLP was getting it wrong too, and we still survived and still benefited from it. Another area where I see LLMs helping in, along similar veins where it's not in front of a human, and if it gets something kind of wrong, it's not too awful, is in uh, synthetic relevance judgments. So the way to train search system traditionally with offline testing is you have humans sit down and say, you know, for this query, these top documents are relevant, this one more than this and so on. And then the notion is that you train machine learning algorithm to either do uh, sorting at retrieval time 
or you can use machine learning to figure out how to tune the weights for the fields and the other stuff I was talking about earlier with that like algorithm that I worked on, but there are a bunch of other ways of doing it, of course. Um, so near term, where I see a lot of excitement for me personally is in looking at how we can use LLMs in a, in a safe way where it's okay if they get things wrong and it won't, you know, lead, lead to catastrophe or somebody misunderstanding their, their, their corpus. That's exciting for me. Longer term, you know, so multimodal search, because everything's going into vector space, you can search for images and text at the same time. Um, putting all that together, that's already being used in e-commerce sites really well uh, in some. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the whole notion of the, 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 the SERP, the search engine results page, with 10 results um, might go away, right? As we move forward, and as things get better and higher quality, and we don't have these systems that just completely make stuff up. And notice that I'm not using the word hallucination, and here I will go on a rant. I cannot stand the word hallucination. It's not a personal thing. I've listened to some people who actually know what they're talking about on this, and I agree with them that the notion of hallucination comes from a uh, similar, uh, uh, a, an anthropomorphizing of the system where a human ha who it can think clearly is not thinking clearly, but if they were in their, air quotes, right mind, however you want to find that, they would get it right. LLMs are nothing like that, right? They're just statistical machines that create stuff that, that, you know, trained on estimating, getting the most probable next token. So they're just creating stuff. It's not they're hallucinating that they accidentally got it wrong. Whatever comes out of them, they got it right or they got it wrong, doesn't really matter. It's created by the same algorithm. So it's not, let's not use that anymore. And to be fair, I used to use hallucinating a lot in... Uh, in looking at OCR and looking at when an OCR engine would be leaning too heavily on the language model and not as heavily on the image model, shall we say. Uh, and it would uh, create words that weren't actually in the text. So I am guilty of using that back in the day for OCR, so forgive me. But right now I can deal with people using the word hallucinate. Very interesting stuff, Tim. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sure we're going to have you back for a second round at some point because there's so much we can get into both, you know, in the PDFs world, the search, which we, I feel like we've barely touched the, the tip off. We clearly have only barely touched the tip yeah. off. There's so much more we can talk about. Uh, you know, it's been fascinating and, you know, the insight in your knowledge and expertise is is a benefit to all of us in the tech world who need to pa pass this stuff out and uh, use uh, use Tika for so many different things. Um, so with all that said and done, um, if people want to be able to get in contact with you, ask you more potentially about Tika stuff, uh, inquire about your expert knowledge and how they could tap into your wealth of insight, what's the best way of people getting in contact with you? You know, find me on LinkedIn or Mastodon uh, or email probably tallison at apache.org is, is the simplest email address I have. There we go. Nice and simple. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Tim. Thank you for spending your time, um, your afternoon with me answering random questions on search. Uh, I hope everyone who's tuned in has found this found this useful. Uh, it's my first first time I've done a podcast where I've had to actually like interview someone. I haven't just like randomly spouted at the camera. So uh, hopefully it's uh, come out all right. Um, thank you all for watching. Uh, and I will be back soon with more data science dossier unwrapped content. Bye for now.